Our hope is for you to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. After the service, begin that process by connecting with a leader and joining one of our many small groups or teams. But for now, sit back and enjoy this message. Well, what is up, Substance? Make some noise wherever you are at. Come on, rowdy crowd. You made it to church. We want to welcome everybody joining us online in downtown, west side, Monterey, Mexico, wherever you are at. We're just so blessed that we get to dive into God's word together. And of course, if we haven't met yet, I'm Pastor Peter Haas. And of course, uh, many of you guys know that every January here at Substance, we love to kick off the new year with a little extra prayer and fasting. And so we have like a 21 day prayer and fasting opportunity. Of course, nobody has to participate in it. Uh, but once you understand what it is, you're like, oh my gosh, this is like winning the lottery, except you get to opt in. It's so amazing. And of course, the Bible talks a lot about prayer and fasting. In fact, actually, uh, the discipline of fasting is actually mentioned over 69 times in the Bible. For every three references to prayer, there's, there's one reference to fasting. Isn't that crazy? And I, I, I think that's a, it actually caught me off guard when I first heard that because I, I know a lot of churches will talk about prayer, but not a lot of churches talk about fasting. And uh, I, I always wondered, well, why is that? And some of you are like, well, I know why it is. I hate it. None of you say that, right? Oh, no, not here at Substance, because you guys love it. No, I, I, fasting, I think a lot of people, they get a, the wrong idea about what it is, what it does, how to do it. And, and I, I think a lot of people have actually had, if you've ever fasted before, I think some people have even had traumatic experiences with fasting. And so let me just, I, what I want to do today is I want to help you fall in love with this, because this discipline is actually the gateway to the miraculous. And I don't know about you, I could use some more miracles in my life. And so maybe just allow me to redefine it a little bit differently for you today. Fasting is a process of abstaining from something for the purpose of worship, prayer, and self-discipline. A lot of people, they think of, uh, of fasting as merely abstaining from food uh, for the purpose of worship, prayer, and fasting. You could fast almost anything, but again, there's, there's several different purposes. It's, it's a form of worship, it's a form of prayer and intercession, and it's a, it's a self-discipline. It's a way to flex the self-denial muscles. So you can, like, you can fast almost anything. You can, my wife loves to fast sweets, mainly because she loves them so much. She, so she'll fast sweets, uh, but uh, you know, you can fast TV, you can fast the news, some of you, you should, uh, some of you, you can fast movies, social media, you can even fast friends, some of you are like, well, doggone it, that's it, I'm going to fast doing the dishes. <laughs> well, okay, talk to your family first, okay, I, almost every year somebody comes up to me and is like, I'm going to fast and then they name a sin. And I'm like, yeah, you should always be fasting that as a Christian. Uh, you know what I'm saying? But I, 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 you, you, get the, you get the idea. I, I think you can, fasting, it's abstaining from something for the purpose of worship, prayer, self-discipline. Now, why though? Why, why really fast things? Well, uh, let's start with the first thing. According to the Bible, it's, it's one of the ways that you and I can build our self-denial muscle. It reveals I think every year that I fast, whatever it is that I'm fasting, it shows me how much I medicate my soul with that thing. And, and for example, let me, I, I never knew how addicted I was to TV until I fasted TV. All of a sudden, I realized how much I like to comfort myself with TV. Now, is there something necessarily wrong, implicitly wrong with TV? Well, I guess it depends on what you're watching, right? If you're watching The Bachelorette, then maybe yet. Uh, maybe, maybe but, but I'm saying, if you're watching TV, I, I think God gave us TV. God gave us taste buds that we would enjoy food. You get the idea. I, I don't think there's anything implicitly wrong with food, but I think sometimes we comfort ourselves more than maybe God intended us to comfort ourselves with it. I think a lot of times God wants us to, God wants to bless us with many things, but a lot of times we bow down and we worship the blessing more than God intended us to, if that makes sense. And so I, I think it's a self-discipline. God wants us to, to exercise, flex that self-denial muscle in a, in a variety of areas. But then, you know, it's also a form of prayer. 
and a form of worship. All throughout the Bible, we see miracles are directly connected to this discipline of fasting. For example, in Isaiah 58, the Bible teaches that those who fast get healing. If you want miracles in your physical body, then one of the gateways to those miracles is a discipline called fasting. I just, at our first Wednesday service, I, I, I talked all about Mark 9. Those who fast have special power over demonic oppression. If you've got something that's just kind of resting on your life or on a loved one, hey, one, Jesus said this kind of demonic oppression comes out through prayer and fasting. You can actually have an advantage over demonic oppression that other people simply won't have without participating in this discipline of fasting. Going back to Isaiah, the prophet said, those who fast get unique financial blessings. You'll ride on the heights of the land, to, to directly quote the scripture. When Ezra fasted in the Old Testament, God gave him protection over his kids and his possessions. I don't know about you, I could always use a little more protection. When Daniel fasted, God gave him understanding and insight. Daniel 9, when Eliezer fasted, God gave him a woman. Come on, single people, you just started taking notes. You're like, hold on, tell me about Eliezer. You know what I'm saying? I'm just telling you, there's a lot of benefits to fasting. And, and I, I went, that's why Jesus, when he started his earthly ministry, the very first thing is he kicked it off with fasting. Why? Because it's, it's how we stay in sync with the favor of God. And so this is not just a neat discipline to be experienced by a few maybe extreme Christians, okay? Uh, really, this is an essential discipline for anybody that wants to experience life to the fullest. So, and as one more example, let me tell you why I love fasting. And, and I'm gonna do it by reading to you a scripture out of 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, starting in verse 23, the Apostle Paul says, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. Sanctification is the process where basically God gets all of us in sync with his spirit, in sync with his kingdom. And then he says, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. In other words, the good news here is that God actually actually wants to help you get in sync with him. And so if you think fasting is something that you just need to kind of like, you know, hype yourself up to do, listen, it's actually something you surrender yourself into. In other words, God will actually give you the power to do the things that he's calling you to do. But I, I wanna point this out because uh, something particular in here, it says, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless. Now, this is the Bible verse where we learn that you and I are a three-part being. You're a spirit, you're a soul, you're a body all in one, okay, so the three part being, and why did God design us that way? Because that's what he's like, he's a trinity, he's a triune God, he's three parts, and so he created us in his image, a three part being, and, and some people are like, well, Pastor Peter, what's the difference between a spirit, soul, and a body? Well, uh, scholars debate it a lot, to be honest, we don't know for sure, but most people would say that you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body, okay? So in other words, you, you are spirit, you your, your spirit communicates with God's spirit. Your spirit is what was reborn when you gave your life to Christ. You're a new creation in Christ. God basically made your spirit come alive on a whole nother level. Your soul is basically your mind, your will, your emotions. And so I, it's the part of you that's also afflicted by sin. And so, you know, my soul is always up and down, right? But your, 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 you, your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions, and your body is your physical body. It's obviously, you know, prone to falling apart, right? So, and then, of course, the good news is, is that God is actually gonna give all of us a resurrection body, and some of you are like, I'll take a resurrection beach body, come on. It's like the next level, God's got you, right? But in the meantime, he's put a limit on you, on your body, and... And of course, in a nutshell, fasting, if I could say it this way, is a way of suppressing the latter two, your soul and your body, so that what? You can amplify, have more attention to your spirits. 
So it's kind of like turning up the volume on your spirit. It's like extending your spiritual antenna so that your spirit can commune with God's spirit. And so a lot of times, whenever I've got like a huge decision to make, I'll, I'll usually do a fast. Like for example, uh, my wife and I pastored in Wisconsin for about 10 years before moving here. And, and uh, I kind of had this sense that God wanted us to move to the Twin Cities Plant Church. And uh, particularly, the Lord had spoken to me, just put this impression on my heart, target Roseville and then um, launch out from there. And of course, I, you know, I, I can get an impression like that, but the other thing is, I don't wanna just be led by my feelings and my impressions. I, I wanna get mentoring in my life. And so, I, and I ultimately, I wanna make sure that God's in this. I wanted God to confirm that, hey, this decision that I was praying about was, was, was truly what God wanted. And so I started praying and fasting. Well, literally, I'm in the middle of a fast, and my wife knew that we were, we were praying about resigning our church and, and moving to, you know, plant substance in Roseville, but, you know, we had not told a soul about this, and so we were literally fasting, and a woman came up to me in the church, and she said, Pastor, I know this is so weird, but I had this dream last night that you and your wife resigned the church here, and you moved to the Twin Cities to plant a church there in a city called Roseville. I don't know if you've ever heard of Roseville, but, and she goes, I probably just had that dream because my daughter's up there, and she needs a church. I know you'd never leave. And this is in the middle of me praying and fasting about that very decision. I kept thinking, what are the odds that a random woman in our church has a random dream about us doing a random thing in a random suburb of a random city at a random time? I mean, like, what are the odds? I'm just telling you, I think God was up in heaven smiling, saying, hey, you wanted insight and understanding like Daniel, who prayed and fasted Daniel night? Well, I'm gonna give it to you. I think God wants to lead and guide us like that on a regular basis. But, but again, we're, a lot of times our soul is so distracted, our physical bodies are constantly crying out. And so really fasting is a way of suppressing that. It's kind of like I had a friend who was born uh, without sight since he, you know, he, he never was able to see. And so he, he had highly attuned his hearing and his smell. He could smell and hear. It was almost, he was almost superhuman when it came to his sense of smell and hearing. He could tell the moment you entered the room just by your cologne and your shoe squeak. And I'd be like, how did you know it was me? I didn't even say a word. And he's like, he, he's like Peter, of course I could tell it was you. You know, like you, you smell. Uh, no, for real though, he, he, he's like, you, you, had a very, you have a distinct smell and I can always tell your shoes. You always wear these certain sneakers. And, and, and because, in other words, he wasn't distracted by his sense of sight and so he could focus on the other more. You see, I think the Lord does this, I think the fasting does the same thing. It's a, it suppresses our mind, will, and emotions and it suppresses our, our physical body and all of a sudden we become more attentive to the spirit, and ultimately, I believe that that's what God wants to do through fasting, is he wants you to have a rich, 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 rich prayer life. Every time I quiet my soul, I hear the supernatural voice of the Holy Spirit just making impressions on my life, and, and some of you are like, well, how do you know it's not just the thoughts in your head? Well, I don't, that's why you scrutinize all impressions with, with God's scripture. The more I memorize God's scripture, the more confidence I have, but ultimately, the more I memorize God's scripture and fast, all of a sudden, I, I'll, I'll open up my prayer journal, and then God just kinda nudges me in my conscience. Peter, this is how you gotta rethink your, the, the way that you're dating your wife right now, or this is how you, you need to rethink how you're parenting your kids right now, and it's very specific. Like, I, I, when I was younger, I never imagined that prayer could actually be a two-way conversation, but now I'm telling you, church, it's a rich conversation, and, I, and, and fasting is one of the ways we amplify the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. Even just this last Sunday night when I started fasting, I'm just telling you, the moment I started fasting, I opened up my prayer journal and God was already just downloading bullet points. It was almost like opening up my email for the first time in a long time. God was just like, Peter, this is what you need to do with the church. This is Stuff like this is gonna happen this year. I want you to prioritize these things and I want you to, 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 to prune your schedule in these areas. I want you to change this on your staff. I want you to invite these five families into doing this. I want you to challenge these two people. I mean, literally, I could not write fast enough. It was that detailed, it was that specific, the types of things that the Lord was speaking to me. And I, I'm gonna be honest with you, early on, I didn't know how to, to tune into God like that. Early on, it was just a basic nudge, like, hey, Peter, time to apologize more. Peter 
time to work out. You know what I'm saying? And, and over the years, though, it got more and more and more specific. And I, 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 want, I just, listen, God wants to give you supernatural advantages in life. It's why he says in Psalm 25, 14, the Lord confides in those who fear him. I'm just telling you, God wants to tell you way more than you realize. And one of the ways we amplify God's voice is through fasting. And I, I, I don't wanna get too deep into how to hear God's voice, but I do, wanna, I, I do wanna get more practical about fasting, which is the first part, is learning how to flex that self-denial muscle. And I, I just really believe that with some of these practical tips, it's gonna, it's gonna enable you to experience some of these miracles that I, I'm talking about. Now, I, I remember early on in my walk with the Lord, I had met numerous people. I had several mentors who had actually done a full 40-day water-only fast, like Jesus did when he kicked off his, his ministry. I had met a lot of people. I, I've, like Previously, I thought people died if they went without food for like three days, right? Okay. Uh, and then when I had met, just, I got to know a lot of people who had done a full 40-day fast. In fact, actually, I, I was even at a church uh, in, in Korea where they, that that's mandatory for all their small group leaders to do a 40-day fast. Can you imagine that? How many of you would be leading small groups in that church, right? But I, I just, you know, for, they, they just taught it as a part of their culture. So I knew it was possible. And I, of course, I thought, well, I'm not, you know, maybe as disciplined as those, per, those people. But surely I could do a three-day fast is what I thought, okay? And let me be honest with you. I was not even remotely ready for a three-day fast. I mean, a th- I mean, by day two, I was like, Lord, like, wh- like, I, like, why me? Why this? Why? You know, like, I, I literally, I had no idea how hard fasting could be. I mean, the headaches, the exhaustion, the mood swings, I was totally useless, right? I was like, I, by day two, I was like, I might as well go to bed. It's 5.30 p.m. Cause I can't even eat anything. It's just so stupid. And I just, literally, I was shocked how like, I mean, in my mind, I thought, I, I thought this is gonna be easy. And then by day two, I was losing my mind. I was like, God, is this really how you want me to worship you? And, and of course, I was making my wife so miserable. Even she was praying to God. God, are you sure this is how you want my husband to worship you? You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I think I was making everybody miserable. And part of the problem was actually quite simple. I, I was doing it all wrong, and I really had no concept of how fasting affected my physical body. And I, I just, I think it's important to go in with a little wisdom. And so I, I wanted to give you a, a couple practical tips that I, I think is gonna make it a little more joy-filled. Ultimately, fasting is meant to be joy-filled. Now, do I love fasting? No, but I like the results. And so I wanna give you some tips that I wish somebody would have taught me decades ago. And of course, every time I talk about fasting, someone writes me an email saying, I think it's dangerous what you're teaching. Fasting is dangerous. And, and, and I think the short answer is, yeah, actually it can be dangerous. I, I, anytime you mess with your body, it can be dangerous, especially those of you who've got complicated medical issues going on. You really do need to have wisdom, get your doctor's advice on some of this stuff. If you're pregnant, if you're diabetic, if you have an eating disorder, you definitely have to get uh, some advice on all of this. One of the, one of the general rules, though, uh, that I've, I've been taught over the years is if you have less than 3% body fat, then yes, fasting can actually hurt your heart, okay? Fasting will eat away at your muscles and can actually hurt your heart. But let's be honest, most of y'all do not have 3% body fat. <laughs> Come on, let's be honest, okay? Uh, like, in fact, research actually shows if you took the average American of 155 pounds, the average American could probably go 40 full days before they hit 3% body fat. Now, which is saying something about America, doesn't it? But I, I just, again, if you're, if you're a kid, you could probably get there in one week. And I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm not even advocating that you do extreme fast like that. I think it actually, I think most people need to start way smaller, like skip lunch once a week, okay? I, that's really what I'm talking about here. Most people, when they fast and they do these more extreme fast water only for, for 14 days, most of the time where they get into trouble is just old-fashioned dehydration and they run out of electrolytes. And so really, if you're gonna do a serious fast like that, and a lot of people in our church do, they do water only for 21 days every single year. And, uh, but I, I really, listen, if that's you, you really have to be careful when it comes to knowing the amount of water you need to be drinking a day and making, I usually uh, throw in electrolyte tablets. In fact, I, I actually, by the way, I wrote an entire blog at peterhaas.org 
Um, if you go to Peter Haas, H-A-A-S dot org, I actually wrote two different blogs. One of them is all on the physiological effects of, of fasting. And so if you're just looking for guidance on water intake, electrolytes, all these types of things, um, I, I, I actually, I even talk about headaches, uh, keto acidosis, I talk about caffeine withdrawal. Again, can fasting be dangerous? Yes, that's why I wrote the whole blog on it. Um, but guess what? Let me say this on the flip side. Research is now showing that it can also be dangerous to not fast. In fact, actually one of the best things you can do for your body is to learn to fast. In fact, actually, research is now showing that, that people who fast regularly will live longer than people who don't. Okay, get this. Let me share some, some interesting medical facts that some of you probably didn't know. That, that actually doing a water-only fast is, one, is a great way um, to change your mood. Fasting is a natural antidepressant. Now, let me tell you, fasting if in the first couple of days will make you depressed. Okay, but, but actually the, the, a lot of research shows that fasting, water only fast, actually dramatically boosts your serotonin, your dopamine, your epinephrine, epinephrine your norepinephrine for, for extended periods of time that people even just doing a small little fast every single month can actually change these chemicals in their body. It's an, uh, for, for extended periods of time, it's a natural antidepressant. Um, fasting also reboots cell regeneration. And, and, and get this, okay, this, it's really fascinating. Research shows that our bodies have all sorts of damaged or aging cells. And, and when you fast, your body naturally sheds those cells and boosts stem cell production, which if you don't know that, uh, stem cells are kind of that universal cell that causes healing. So in case you have bad knees or bad shoulders or ligaments or joint issues, it boosts stem cells. It, it actually has a, there's a significant boost in stem cells after you fast for seven days. And uh, in fact, there's actually a, a huge new body of research coming out on fasting and how it actually decreases uh, chemotherapy side effects. It actually uh, gives you an advantage when it comes to cancer. Uh, again, it boosts, it, it, it boosts stem cells so your body heals faster. Research is showing that fasting actually has an impact on inflammation. A simple five-day veggie fast. I just read a study recently um, on a five-day veggie fast once a month was proven to have a similar impact and even a better impact than the vast majority of inflammation drugs on the market right now. When I read that, now, I, many of you guys know I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. I spent a lot of money on medication. When I read that and I saw all the trials on how it compared, it, it kind of awakened me to another, uh, another opportunity that maybe I wasn't considering. In fact, actually, fasting decreases autoimmune issues, it decreases heart issues, decreases gut issues, decreases skin problems, decreases endocrine joint disorders, actually has a huge impact on lungs. I just recently read a study where people with chronic asthma, where they fasted for longer than 14 days, over 70% of test subjects completely eliminated histamines in their lungs that was inflaming their asthma, 70% saw a giant reduction to the point where they felt like they didn't even have asthma anymore. I mean, talk about crazy differences. And again, if you want some of the citations to this, just check out my blog, once again, peterhaas.org. Um, but, it, and maybe you're here and you're like, well, why aren't people talking about these benefits more? Well, you know, we could probably think of a thousand reasons, right? We could cynically say, well, maybe Big Pharma wants us addicted to their drug. Let's be honest. Most of us would rather just pop a pill than learn about fasting. Come on, I, I think it would be easier. I think we, we have the lifestyle that we want. I think at the end of the day, really all I'm trying to say is this. I'm just trying to stimulate you with different thoughts that will cause you to be curious to dive in a little bit more, but all I'm saying is this, is what if the Bible was true all along, those who fast get healed, Isaiah 58. All I'm saying is what if the Bible is true? What if God gave us this discipline as a blessing? not as an obligation, and so it starts, it begs the question, well then how do we start? What are some simple little practical ways to do this? Well, I encourage people, just start small. It doesn't have to be big, it could be something as simple as fast social media for two days a week. Fast, 
you know, uh, just skip lunch on Mondays or something simple, okay? Just, again, test this out. Every year, I always, every year that our church does a church-wide fast, I always take it a little bit further, okay? I'm always stretching myself. I'm always seeing what, what I'm capable of and learning about my body, okay? Second thing, I, I always tell people, be reasonable about caffeine withdrawal and, and keto flu. If you don't know what uh, that is, uh, well, most Americans are addicted to coffee and addicted to carbs, okay? And, and listen, when you withdraw off these things just cold turkey, guess what? You're gonna have withdrawal symptoms, specifically headaches, okay? The first couple times I fasted, I underestimated. I don't drink a whole lot of coffee, but even one to two cups a day will be enough to cause your, your uh, to get a headache. And so I, a lot of times I tell people, hey, listen, if you, you know, uh, just keep your coffee. Don't make it about caffeine. Make it about a fast, okay? Let this be your opportunity to, to grow closer to the Lord. Um, and so actually, I, I usually just continue drinking coffee throughout my fast. And, and of course, if you're a five cups a day person, you probably do need to fast coffee. But you know what I'm saying, okay? Uh, in fact, I, I, another thing is... Uh, Keto flu, if you've ever, you know, most people are addicted to carbs. When your body, when you're withdrawing from a carb lifestyle, right around day three, four, your body will go into ketoacidosis. Some people call it keto flu. It's where your, your, your body learns to burn fat instead of burning uh, carbs and protein. And a lot of times you get a headache. Sometimes you get like flu-like symptoms that last for about 24 hours. So usually before I do an extended water-only fast, I'll, I'll spend the previous week eating keto-friendly foods so that my body is adjusting into this over the period of seven days and it's not as traumatic. Get, the more you do it, the more your, the, your body gets efficient at doing it. It was really only like the first like four times that I went into ketosis that I would get headaches. And so I, I actually, on my blog, I, I give you a bunch of uh, tips on how to survive that. Because at the end of the day, church, I don't want you to be miserable. God does not want you to be miserable. He wants this to be a joy-filled discipline, but you still have to learn how, to, how your body works. And so there's a certain degree of, of, self, of your learning about yourself and learning about your spirit and your soul as you do this. And so again, just experiment with this. But I have all sorts of tips on my blog. The third thing I always tell people is just create a calendar with days off, okay? What do I mean by that? If you're gonna do a 21-day fast, don't just, I like to mix it up, okay? So for example, some people, when they create a fasting calendar, they say, okay, I'm gonna go water only on Mondays, then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I'm gonna do fruits and vegetables, sometimes called a Daniel fast. Uh, and, then, and then a lot of people, they take a day off. I encourage you, have a flex day here and there, okay? Sometimes you're hosting people. There's nothing weirder than taking someone out for dinner and then watching them eat the entire time. Okay, or, or like as another example, my, my second daughter always had, her birthday was always in the middle of our fast, and of course, you know, I didn't want her to think, hey, we don't celebrate you because you were born at the wrong time of year. Uh, you know, like I, I didn't, you know what I'm saying? We, we, we would have flex days, days where I would, I would take a day off, and um, uh, you know, it, in some ways it's actually good because uh, a lot of times when you're fasting, you start to obsess over things, the, you start to obsess about things, it's a natural kind of response of, you know, if you fast TV, you obsess over TV. Um, I, I, I would obsess over certain foods when I was fasting, I'd be like, oh my gosh, pizza, pizza. It, it, I, actually, I would obsess over all food when I fast, okay? So I would just be like, and, and then I'd have my day off and then I'd have it and then I'd realize, oh, that didn't really fulfill me as much as I thought. And then, you know, you, you, start, to, you start to get a rhythm of, of how your body works with this. Uh, fourth thing, and this is the most important thing, listen, every single time you fast, you're gonna have a humbling experience for at least some little portion of it. If you fail a bunch, don't overthink it. Some people, they get so weird every time they fast. They get caught in like a shame loop of I'm a terrible Christian. Well, let me tell you something. You on your best day still fall short of the glory of God. That's the whole point of Christianity is you couldn't do it. Therefore, God had to send his son to die for you, okay? So stop thinking it's about you. It's never been about you. Fasting reminds you just how frail you are and how much you need a savior. That's the whole point. So you getting caught in this shame loop actually is, a, is, is probably a sign that you have a little bit of self-righteousness, a little self-reliance. You're, you're missing the whole point of Christianity. And so I always encourage people, hey, listen, 
Fasting is intended to be humbling. The goal is practice, not perfection. You'll never attain perfection, okay? In fact, your mind is gonna throw fits. Don't worry, the little tantrums that, that your brain throws are gonna get smaller and smaller. I always tell people, hey, if you go without food, cruddy food will always be there to cuddle you at the end of the fast, okay? So just chill, you will eat cake again. Um, I'm just telling you, uh, and, and so here's what's beautiful. Fasting will always be humbling, but don't let shame be a part of it. Does that make sense? Humility is fine, shame is not. Um, I, there was this guy who came up to me in the middle of a fast uh, a couple of years ago, and he was just like, he was all up in his head. God is so disappointed in me. And I'm like, bro, God is not disappointed in you. You just fasted and you experienced how frail you are. Just be quiet, stop the fast, just eat whatever. Go eat pizza today. And he's like, really? I think he was expecting me as a pastor to say, buck up, young man, you know, like, he was expecting me to give this over inspirational speech and I was just, I literally felt like the Lord was nudging me to tell him, stop your fast. This whole fast has been silly for you. You're just, you literally set up a hurdle so high you tripped over it and now you wipe down your face and then you're mad at yourself. Well, really, you, sh you shouldn't have even been doing that type of fast in the first place. I'm like, go home, have pizza and then, and then, Reset tomorrow. Then I want you, what I want you to do is wake up tomorrow, just read your Bible, and then ask God about the real type of fast you're supposed to do. And guess what? He, he woke up the next day, you know, he ate a bunch of food. He said he felt terrible, and then he woke up the next day because um, pizza didn't fulfill him as much as he imagined it would, right? So he did it. And then uh, he woke up the next day, read his Bible, and the whole next week, he did a water-only fast, and he said it was the most worship-filled, joy-filled thing ever. He was just, he, he just needed a reset. He got caught up in this weird headspace. And so I wanna encourage you, don't allow that to happen when you fast, because the whole point of fasting is to grow closer to God, not, not suffer and in in turn into a weird, you know, in, in, into a, a weird Christian, okay? So practice and laugh when you fail. That's the whole goal of this. Yet yeah, challenge yourself. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay, because, and let me, let me end with this, okay? I just wanna end with one last little Bible text that'll encourage you on, on how to approach this. I always say, before you fast, get a fasting goal. Like, is there any area in your life where you could use a breakthrough? like a, a miracle, maybe it's in your physical body, your finances, your family, just, I want you to write out a, a goal, or maybe even it's just like, God, I want you to speak to me about a, a, a new goal for this year. What do you want this year to look like for me? And I, I uh, if I could end with this, a, a quick little encouragement out of Nehemiah chapter one. If you've never read the book of Nehemiah, the context of this book is it's all about how God's people were not living a disciplined life, and God warned them over and over and over again, hey, listen, if you don't change the way you're living, a foreign nation is gonna take you over and you are gonna be exiles and, 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 and everything is gonna fall apart. And of course, they didn't listen, they refused to flex the self-denial muscle, and so the worst case scenario happened, they, they decided to enlist in the school of hard knocks Babylon came in, took them over, sent them all into exile, and, and so Jerusalem, the temple was completely destroyed, and so here they are 70 years later. The Jews started returning to the temple, returning to Jerusalem, but the city was a mess, the, the church was a mess, the walls were broken down, the gates were burned, and the people were constantly being harassed by foreign nations, war in the region, and so Nehemiah, the man of God in this situation, had this revelation, and he realized, you know what? Until a wall is built, God's church is never gonna flourish. And so, so he, he, he started saying, God, should I take on this building project? Should I build your church? Should I? In other words, God gave him a goal. He knew that, that there's a lack of infrastructure and it's killing, it's limiting things for God's people. And so check this out. In Nehemiah chapter one, verse four, it says this. Nehemiah writes, when I heard all these, these bad reports about Jerusalem, I sat down and I wept. He wept because he, he, he saw that God's people were not where they needed to be. And maybe you're here today and you're in a kind of a similar mood. You're like, you know what? I can relate to that Nehemiah guy. Maybe you're here and your marriage is not where you want it. Your body is not where you want it. And you, you, you've been weeping. That God, it, I want to encourage you. God has seen those tears. Actually, sorrow is sometimes a great place to be because those are the moments where God actually can intersect with our lives 
in miraculous ways. And so Nehemiah writes, Nehemiah 1.4, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. But then he adds this, for some days I mourned and I fasted. In other words, I don't wanna just sit there and wallow in my self-pity. I wanna, I wanna get closer to God through this. And so it says, he mourned and he fasted. He mourned and he fasted. He mourned and he what? Fasted. Now I wanna point that out because the reason why he fasted is because when he knew that God started putting this goal of building a wall on his heart, he knew, come on, Nehemiah, you don't have what it takes to build that wall. He knew it was a virtually impossible task. At, at the very minimum, people told him it's gonna take at least three years to build and, and not to mention way more money than you can afford. So, you know, he's got a heart to do something that is impossible for him. And yet, you know what? Fasting is a great way to enlist the help of God. And keep in mind, at this very moment, Jerusalem is at war. Foreign nations keep attacking. I mean, how in the world is he supposed to pull off a giant, expensive construction process in the middle of a war for every one construction worker? He's gotta have one uh, soldier? I mean, can you imagine that? How nerve-wracking. I mean, as if construction isn't dangerous enough by itself, let alone getting a spear in your back, right? And then, so remember what Nehemiah said he did, though, in chapter one, verse four? He mourned and he fasted. And watch this, let me, I, I encourage you to read this on your own free time, but the, the, the synopsis is this, is that God's people humbled themselves through fasting, and listen, God enabled them to do in 52 days what everyone thought would take at least three years. They did in 52 days what they imagined would take at least three years. Now, I wanna ask the ultimate question, it's this, why did God put that story in his book? Why is, that, why is that story in our Bibles? I ultimately believe it's because God wanted to draw a connection between fasting and efficiency. He wanted to draw a connection between fasting and productivity. Or to put it another way, I actually believe that God brought you to church today because he wants you to fast forward your life through fasting. Because that's ultimately what fasting does. Is it humbling? Yes. But that's the whole point, is to remind us of our dependency upon God. And then when all of a sudden we realize that and we place our faith in God, all, that's where God can all of a sudden flex his supernatural muscles on our behalf. Because once again, here's the benefits. Some of you, you got things going on in your marriage or your families, and wouldn't it be great if God could fast forward your marriage and your family to help? Some of you, you got things going on in your finances. It, it'll take you three years to get out of debt. But what if, wouldn't it be great if you did a fast and God did in 52 days what would normally take three years? If you're wondering if God could do it, he can. Again, they accomplished in 52 days what would normally take three years. That's, that's if I, I actually uh, did the math and it's 1,095 days. What if God could cut off 1,095 days of work? Hard labor. If God could just take it off your life simply because you sought the Lord with a fast. Come on. Some of you have been waiting for things, waiting for healing, for deliverance, promotion, clarity. What if God could cut off the wait time by 1,095 days? Listen, he can. The question is, will you humble yourself and seek God by doing a simple little discipline? I'm just telling you, even the smallest little fast I believe moves the heart of God. And here's ultimately the result. Watch out what happened in Nehemiah 6.16. When all our enemies heard about us finishing the wall in a supernatural amount of time, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. God wants your coworkers, your friends, and your family to say, there's no way you could have done that aside from the favor of God. They, th that's what God wants to be said about your life and church. That's what I want to be said about our congregation. There's no way that you could build a church like this in, in the time that, that we did. There's no way that you could be healthy, that I could be healthy apart from the favor of God. But listen, these are the types of breakthroughs that God wants you to have this year. But will you take them up on it? Will you participate in this discipline? And so just wherever you're at, would you just bow your heads, close your eyes, and let's just let the, the Spirit of God speak to our consciences about this. Right now, 
God, you see all of our lives. You see where we're at. Lord, some of us are brand new to this Christianity thing. In fact, there's probably a few people here who are, are, like, I don't, who are like, I don't even know if I believe in any of this stuff. But God, I, I really do believe that you take just little tiny bits of faith and you love to reveal yourself. You love to supernaturally break through in our lives. And so I pray that we would just dare to activate our faith by doing these little disciplines that you've given to us. And so Lord, speak to us. What is it that you would call us to fast? And for some of us, that might be, again, news, social media, it might be food, it might be something else. But Lord, I pray that every single person watching this message today would just take up the challenge, would, would get an area of their lives where they really believe that you wanna do a breakthrough and that they would see a miracle take place in their lives. And maybe you're here and you're new to this whole God thing. You've never even experienced a miracle before. Or maybe you're here and you've never even given your life to Christ before. I, I just believe that I, in, in this little moment of prayer, God can reset everything for you and reveal himself to you. And if that's something you're interested in, just would everybody join in and pray this simple little prayer after me? Just would you do this? Just all of us joining in together. Just say this after me. Say, dear Jesus, forgive me, renew me, and lead me starting today and for the rest of my life. In Jesus' precious name we pray. If you agree with that prayer, just say amen. Amen. I'm telling you, church, we are going to see miracles this month. But with all that said, here's what we're going to do is we're going to have our campus pastors come on up and tell us where we're going to go next. I love you guys. I can't wait to hear what the miracles God's doing in your life.